Hi, welcome back to Joe Blogs. In today's episode, I want to talk to you about a leaked document that's come out from the Ministry of Defence in Germany and been published by the German newspaper Bild, which claims that President Putin has a nine-step plan towards World War III in the summer of 2025. This plan focuses in on the enclave of Kaliningrad, which is the city that's located on the Baltic Sea and officially part of Russia. However, it doesn't have any land borders with Russia. It was previously known as Konigsberg and was gifted to Russia after World War II as part of the Potsdam Agreement. So in today's video, we'll go through exactly why Kaliningrad is part of Russia and what the issues are surrounding that. We'll have a look at what's called the Sawalki Gap, which is the area of land between Russia and Kaliningrad and is the focus of President Putin's plan. We'll then go through the nine steps of his plan. We'll talk about what dates things are going to be happening on, according to Build newspaper. We'll then go on to have a look at what the NATO response to this plan is likely to be. And then finally today, I'll wrap up with my summary. So what I think the likelihood of this nine step plan actually taking place are, and whether or not we're all heading towards World War III in the summer of 2025. If we are, then you better make sure that you get a good holiday in in 2024, because Europe certainly won't be a good place to be holidaying this time next year. But before we get into all of that, once again, I'd like to say thank you so much to everybody that sent me messages about the recent passing of my father. Really appreciate all of that. And I also appreciate all of the support that you've been giving me by buying me a coffee, sending me YouTube super thanks and signing up as patrons and members. Thank you so much. It really does help me. Kaliningrad is officially part of Russia. However, as you can see from this map, it doesn't share a land border. And so all of the supplies that go from Russia to Kaliningrad either have to go via the Baltic Sea or the railway link that passes through Belarus and Lithuania. Originally, the city of Kaliningrad was called Konigsberg and was founded in 1255 by the Teutonic Knights. In 1525, it became the capital of the Duchy of Prussia, which at the time was part of Poland. In 1701, Konigsberg became part of Germany when Prussia and Germany united. However, in 1758, the city was annexed by Russia as part of the Seven Years' War. Germany retook the city in 1762, and it remained part of the German Empire until the end of World War II. The city was besieged unsuccessfully by the Russians during World War I. However, in World War II, it was virtually destroyed by the Red Army after a two-month siege which ended in April 1945. The 14th century cathedral the Grand Castle built by the Teutonic Knights and the Old University were all left in ruins. At the end of World War II, the Allied leaders met at Potsdam, a suburb of Berlin, to discuss the breakup of the former German Empire. The Allies agreed that Germany would lose further territory in the East, including East Prussia and Konigsberg, with the majority of land going to Poland. Germany's eastern border was reduced to just 50 miles east of Berlin, which left Konigsberg open for reallocation. Joseph Stalin of Russia saw an opportunity to gain a valuable port on the Baltic Sea and seized Konigsberg as part of Russia. At the end of World War II, Konigsberg had a population of 360,000 people. However, after the reallocation to Russia, only 72,000 people remained. In 1946, Russia renamed Konigsberg as Kaliningrad after Mikhail Kalinin, an influential Bolshevik who'd taken part in the Russian Revolution. Now, the reason that Kaliningrad is important to Russia is that it has a Baltic coastline and it doesn't freeze during the winter. It's actually the only official Russian port that doesn't freeze. So therefore, if Russia was to get involved in some sort of military conflict, Obviously, having a port that isn't frozen would be useful, but also it acts as a launch platform for the rest of the Baltic Sea area. Russia has military personnel and fighter aircraft located in Kaliningrad, and therefore it can act as a base if Russia does become involved in some sort of wider military conflict. But one of the issues from Russia's point of view is actually getting supplies directly into Kaliningrad because the Sawalki Gap is the area of land that sits between Belarus, which is a long-standing partner of Russia and therefore can be seen as an extended part of Russia in the event of some sort of bigger military conflict. The Sawalki Gap is a sparsely populated region 
in the northeastern corner of Poland, which is hilly and one of the coldest areas of Poland. The area is crossed by numerous river valleys and deep lakes, and is covered with thick forests and marshes. The road network in the area is sparse, and the nearest large airport is located several hundred kilometers away. And the area is home to some ethnic minorities, including Ukrainians and Lithuanians. The railway link that exists between Russia and Kaliningrad is the only tangible way of moving supplies. And in the late 1990s, Russia contacted Poland and asked for permission to build a motorway to be able to send road traffic. However, Poland subsequently declined this request and no road transport was ever built. As a result of these land access issues, the only feasible way of Russia being able to move things like nuclear warheads to Kaliningrad is via the sea. Step one of President Putin's nine-step plan towards World War III in the summer of 2025 involves the mobilization of a further 200,000 men, which is reportedly due to take place in February 2024. Now, obviously, as it stands at the moment, there has been no news of this mobilization. So far in the conflict with Ukraine, President Putin has announced a formal mobilization towards the end of 2022 of 300,000 troops, which led to a mass exodus from the country. Around 700,000 people were reported to have fled the country to avoid that mobilization. And most recently, a decree was signed increasing the size of the armed forces by a further 170,000 people. So it will be very interesting to see whether or not a formal mobilization of a further 200,000 troops is declared in February 24. And if it is, that gives us an indication that this nine-step plan could actually be happening. The next step in the nine-step plan is reported to take place in the spring of 2024. We don't have an exact date as to when it's going to happen. And this involves an increase in the fighting in Ukraine. And the logic behind this step is to draw more forces, more resources and more people into the war in Ukraine so that NATO's efforts and financial support are focused on what's happening in Ukraine to deflect attention away from Russia's wider plans. Step three is reported to be taking place in July 2024 and is a two-pronged attack. The first side of this focuses in on cyber attacks against the West. So this warfare will take the form of digital attacks and bringing down websites to try to cause economic chaos. And at the same time as that digital warfare is happening, Russia will also be supporting ethnic problems in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, stirring up civil unrest to try to create warfare and problems within each of those countries. Step 4 is reported to be taking place in September 2024, when Russia will amass 50,000 troops in Belarus on the border of Lithuania and Poland, readying itself for the offensive that's likely to take place over the next 12 months. Step 5 takes place in October 2024, when Russia will start moving missiles and troops into Kaliningrad. So that means it would have 50,000 troops in Belarus and a similar number of troops sitting in Kaliningrad that are fully armed, waiting to take advantage of the fact that Russia wants to control the Sawalki Gap. Now, the timing of step six is really interesting because it's planned to be in December 2024, which potentially could be a time when the USA is in a state of flux. Because if there is a change of president, the election takes place on November the 5th, 2024. And the inauguration of the new president, if a new president was to take over from Joe Biden, wouldn't actually take place until the 20th of January. So you have this period of technical no man's land where the old president is exiting, the new president has been voted into power, but doesn't actually take office for another month or so. And Russia is trying to exploit the potential uncertainty that that could create in the USA by starting conflict in the Sawalki Gap region. So it would be supporting all of the minorities in Poland, Lithuania and Estonia, trying to create unrest and fighting at a time when NATO and the USA could be potentially vulnerable. 
Step seven is the further strengthening of the troop buildup in Belarus. It's reported that up to 70,000 troops would now be in the region alongside tank units and other armed vehicles. So Russia would effectively be gearing up for some sort of land offensive to be able to move into the Sawalki Gap and join up with Kaliningrad. Step eight is scheduled to take place in May 2025 by which time it's estimated that Russia will have 500,000 troops sitting either side of the Sawalki Gap. And at that point, it's also forecast that NATO will have moved 300,000 troops into the region in anticipation of the start of some sort of warfare in the region. And finally, step nine, which is referred to as Day X, is the point when Russia will formally launch an offensive into the Sawalki Gap and at that stage, NATO will need to make a decision as to what's happening, because officially, Russia will have launched an offensive into Poland, which is part of NATO. And under the terms of the NATO alliance, NATO will be officially required to support Poland. And that will be the point when the world is potentially facing World War III. NATO, which was formed in 1949, is officially a peacekeeping organisation. And this map of Europe shows the evolution of NATO, dating back to its founding in 1949. NATO currently consists of 31 members. It was previously 30, however Finland joined recently. And Sweden is currently waiting for approval from Turkey. It's got the first round of approval, but needs to receive full sign-off before it can officially join. And in addition to the European members, the two other major players are the United States and Canada. NATO's official goal is to promote democratic values and enable members to consult and cooperate on defence and security related issues to solve problems, build trust and in the long run prevent conflict. On the military side of things, NATO is committed to the peaceful resolution of disputes. However, if diplomatic efforts fail, it has the military power to undertake crisis management operations. And this chart shows the combined number of military personnel in NATO countries dating back to 2014. And as you can see, the combined military forces are currently sitting at around 3.4 million personnel. And this chart shows the estimated military spending power of NATO countries up to 2023. And as you can see, the biggest single player, not surprisingly, is the United States in terms of percentage of GDP, 3.5% followed by the United Kingdom, Germany, France, Italy, Poland, Canada, Spain and Turkey. So what's the summary and conclusion today? Well, I wanted to post this video because I think the leak of this military document, which says that President Putin has a nine step plan towards some sort of event that could trigger World War Three, is clearly an important thing to discuss because if we did get into a wider military conflict, that would obviously be extremely bad news for the global economy. On this channel, we're predominantly focusing in on the economic impacts of what's happening all around the world. And the biggest single disaster for the global economy would be for multiple countries to enter into a war simultaneously. Because as we've seen from the discussions on Russia, holding a war and supporting a war is bad news for your economy because ultimately you're diverting a lot of effort and finance and people into something that doesn't provide any sort of investment returns. Generally speaking, a war is bad news both long term and short term for your economy. So if the world does get drawn into a wider offensive, that would obviously be very bad news for the global economy. It would also obviously be extremely bad news for all of the people that were forced into fighting. But what's the likelihood of this actually happening? Is this just another leaked document that just talks about what could potentially happen? Or is this a realistic strategy that President Putin is likely to follow? Well, when you take a step back and look at what's been happening in Ukraine over the last 10 years, in 2014, Russia annexed Crimea because it claimed that Crimea historically should have been part of Russia and there were lots of other reasons why it decided to go in and claim that region. And following on from that, it then launched an offensive in 2022 into Ukraine itself. And amazingly, we are now coming up towards the second anniversary. It's almost been two years that the war in Ukraine has been going on. So President Putin and Russia 
are focused on trying to take over more territory to expand the Russian Empire. And when you look at the situation with Kaliningrad, it does look very unusual. Firstly, I think it's unusual that Russia were given it after the end of World War II. It didn't really make any sense because it wasn't joined to Russia. If you're going to take land and give it to another country, generally speaking, in the modern era, it tends to be areas that are actually on your borders. To have something that's detached from Russia, but still part of Russia, does cause problems, as we've talked about earlier in the video, in terms of supplies and being able to keep everything moving. So Russia does definitely want to join Kaliningrad. And the reason that Kaliningrad is important from President Putin's point of view is that the port doesn't freeze. So if Russia did get involved in a wider conflict with the rest of Europe, it would give it access to a port that could still be used by boats. And also, it's closer to some of those European countries if you're wanting to launch offensives in terms of airstrikes. So President Putin does want to protect Kaliningrad, and ideally, he would like to join it to the rest of Russia. So the Sawalki Gap that we've talked about is an important area of land. So the fact that he's already launched offensives in Crimea and part of Ukraine means that it is definitely feasible that he will think about trying to join up Kaliningrad to bring home all of those supplies. So I think firstly to answer the question as to whether or not it's feasible that this nine-step plan did originate in Russia, I think there is definitely a possibility that it did. To answer the second question as to whether or not it will be acted upon, I'm not entirely sure, because entering into the Sawalki Gap basically means invading Poland. And if Russia does that, it will definitely draw the whole of NATO into this offensive. Now, over the last two years, there has been a lot of talk about Ukraine joining NATO. President Zelensky of Ukraine is very keen on joining. Obviously, he wants NATO to come along and support officially. Rather than just providing financial and military support on a third-party basis, he would like to see boots on the ground. And President Putin has made it very clear that if that happened, then that would be catastrophic from Russia's point of view, and they would go on an all-out offensive. So realistically, I don't think President Putin really wants to take on NATO because, as we saw in the graphics earlier, NATO have a lot of firepower and a lot of people and a lot of financial resources. So realistically, does Russia want to poke the bear and get involved in a full war with NATO? I don't think so. When you look at the area of land that it would be fighting for, that 60-mile gap, between Kaliningrad and Russia, it doesn't really seem worth it to me. However, Russia did invade Ukraine, which nobody was really expecting. So there is always a chance that this could happen because nobody really knows what President Putin is thinking. He's not working out things logically. If he was, he probably wouldn't have invaded Ukraine because when you look at the overall impact on the Russian economy, it's been a disaster. It really wasn't a good idea. So he's not looking at things from a financial point of view. He's looking at things in a different way. So I guess there is a possibility, but if I was betting on it, I don't think this nine-step plan will be initiated. I don't think Russia will try to take over that area of land between Kaliningrad and Russia. And I don't think there will be a World War III in the summer of 2025. But then again, nobody was expecting the war in Ukraine to actually start. So there definitely is a slim chance that this could happen. So hopefully you've enjoyed today's video. You found it useful, informative, and thought-provoking. If you've liked what I've said, then please give me a thumbs up. Thank you for watching this video all the way through to the end. And here's something to put a smile on your face.